You either raise your fists or you say hallelujah. Hi, I'm Clovis Casali in Paris, and this is Encore. Today, we have a film show for you with our very own critic, Lisa Nesselson, who's standing by for us in Deauville, where the American Film Festival is underway. A total of 60 movies are screened over 10 days. On the red carpet this year, many Hollywood stars. First, Jesse Eisenberg, who notably played Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg, in the social network. He received the Deauville Talent Award and presented his first film as director. It's called When You're Finish Saving the World. British actress Tandy Wynne Newton also received this award. She starred in Mission Impossible 2 and has worked with prestigious directors like David Cronenberg, Bernardo Bertolucci, and Xavier Dolan. And finally, the Hollywood Rising Star Award went to Lucy Boynton who you might have seen in the biopic Bohemian Rhapsody, where she plays Freddie Mercury's partner. Lucy Boynton told our team in Normandy what this prize meant to her. Take a listen. I mean, it feels so great to be back. The last time I was here, it was the first time I was presenting a film on my own, and Sing Street has been such a special one in my life um, and in my career. So I already have that foundation of really lovely association to Deville Film Festival, so it was exciting to come back, but also terrifying. You'll be able to watch uh, Eve Jackson's interview with Lucy Boynton later in the week. Now let's waste no time and head to Deville with Lisa. Lisa, your thoughts, please, on the opening night film, Call Jane. What's it about? I, as a general rule, kind of like time travel films, and I also sometimes like horror films, but I don't like when those two components are uh, combined too close to home. Call Jane is based on the true story of the Jane Collective in my native Chicago, a group of very brave women who set up a clandestine system for providing safe completely illegal abortions to women who needed them. So the title called Jane comes from stickers that were up all over town saying pregnant, uh, anxiety, worried, call Jane. Um, the script is very, very smart because it takes the point of view of a suburban mother and housewife played by Elizabeth Banks who uh, has a medical condition. She's pregnant with a very desired second child, but if she carries that pregnancy through to term, it may just kill her. So she asks for a, a medical abortion, the hospital refuses, and she ends up in this world of the Call Jane Collective. Here's a clip. The film stars Kate Mara, uh, Sigourney Weaver, and Elizabeth Banks. Which one of you is Jane? <laughs> We're all Jane. We have organizing meetings. That's the address. How are we going to get through them all? This 11-year-old girl deserves oh, it. Well, this lady has cancer. She was raped. It has to be random. It's life or death for some of them. It's life or death for all of them. Made my mind up. What do you mean? Our class. Let's take a deep breath. You got a knack for this. Could have been a nurse. Could have been a doctor. We are entirely dependent on one man. We can't change what it costs, Joy. It's economics. It's interesting how economics always seems to mean that black women get screwed. Stand up, stand up. And one documentary also caught your attention. It's called Body Parts. It's on the way sex scenes have been filmed and nudity has been handled in movies. Tell us more. Well, this is a fascinating topic, and uh, it's very well treated. If you go back to the 20s and 30s, the modern American woman was barely wearing underwear under her slinky clothes. She was having a fine old time. It was obvious that women were having sex outside the confines of marriage. Then the production code came in and said that married couples had to sleep in separate beds, and no kiss could last longer than three seconds on screen because that would corrupt everybody. And then we went full cycle to the 60s and sexual liberation and those body parts were suddenly all over the place but nobody asked the women those parts belong to so there's fascinating interviews with Jane Fonda who started her career in the late 1950s when everything was still prudish then came to France married Roger Vadim and was completely nude and frolicking in the classic Barbarella uh, there's an interview with Rosanna Arquette who was hired for a film when she was 19 because as she says she was extremely well endowed no 
nobody told her that they expected her to just take her T-shirt off on camera. And because she was 19, she did it. Now we have a post on films called Intimacy Coordinator, who tries to make sure that nobody does anything they're uncomfortable with in the course of filming a film or a TV series. Interesting indeed. Now to one of the most famous songs covered by many artists, originally written by Leonard Cohen. Hallelujah is now the subject of a documentary. And it's a look, of course, at the life of the late Canadian singer songwriter. It's a two hour long film on one song. Does it work, Lisa? Well, it worked for me. Um, I was a little skeptical going in, but the uh, husband and wife uh, documentary making team of Dan Geller and Dana Goldfein have mined incredible resources to put together the story of Cohen's up and down career. And, uh, you know, he once uh, spoke with uh, Bob Dylan, who, uh, who said that it took him uh, about an hour to write most of his songs. And <laughs> Leonard Cohen worked on this one for what seems like centuries. There are so many versions. The filmmakers have his actual handwritten scribbles. And now it's a classic that's played at funerals, at weddings. But if you knew some of the lyrics that uh, Cohen had considered over the years, you might not want to use that song for those occasions. Uh, I thought it was absolutely captivating. And they found so much interesting archival footage because, you know, we don't have any footage of, uh, say, Mozart sitting on a couch on uh, TV shows talking about his work. We just have the work. In this case, we have the man and the work. Okay, Lisa, let's take a look at Alleluia and hear from the director. My feelings about Leonard were that he was a god. You know, uh, it was the great Leonard Cohen and how were we possibly going to do justice to this godlike um, creator of these amazing songs. It all went Hallelujah really beat the odds and that it's its own thing now. And it has its own life. Nothing, nothing I, I, mean, I think he was tickled pink that Everybody and their sister are singing the song. Hallelujah. You're getting things that are so deep and so resonant in your own spiritual journey that you are benefiting from his. Clearly an unmissable movie for all Leonard Cohen fans. And speaking of music legends, here's a film where the director got rare access to Bowie materials never been seen before. Tell us more, Lisa. You know, like it turns out, Bob Dylan had kept every single flyer, every single scrap of paper. So did David Bowie. And they have uh, the makings of a, a fabulous two hour and 14 minute immersive, slightly exhausting, but in a good way, account of Bowie's life and work. He was not just an entertainer. He was absolutely an artist from the very beginning and uh, and kind of conscious of uh, how he had the power through the way he looked, through the way he sounded, through the material he created to uh, to change the world in a lot of ways for the better. Uh, in retrospect, this is absolutely astonishing to watch. And it's freewheeling, and yet I would call it rigorous. And our culture editor, Eve Jackson, got to meet director Brett Morgan. He told her uh, he didn't just want to make a biographical documentary. Take a listen. I am interested in making films that aren't so much about my subjects, but films that tend to invite the audience to experience the subject. I'm very aware that there are 29 books about David Bowie, and none of them give me a better understanding of him than listening to one of his songs. So the idea of immersing one in the artist's own sort of point of view is something that very exciting to me. All people, no matter who they are, all wish they'd appreciated life more. It's what you do in life that's important, not how much time you have. Or what you wish you'd done.
charismatic as ever, David Bowie. And to wrap up this show, a word on this selection. In this day and age where it seems it's all about blockbusters, unfortunately, some will say, uh, Deauville honours independent cinema, and that's a breath of fresh air, maybe. Tell us uh, about one of these films in competition, Lisa. Well, there's 13 films in the competition and the jury is not going to have an easy time based on what I've seen so far. I like several of them very much, but one that really sticks with me is a movie called Duel, D-U-A-L. And uh, it's got a sort of deadpan approach to the idea of human cloning. The main protagonist is a young woman who is given a diagnosis that she has a very rare disease and there's a 98% chance that she's going to die very soon. And of course, society Society now offers us the chance so that your loved ones won't really have to grieve your passing for you to clone yourself and sort of train your clone to be just like you. So that's what this woman does, except then she goes into remission and all of a sudden there's two of her and that's not permitted. So she has to train to somehow try and do in her double. I enjoyed it very much. Okay, Lisa, thank you very much. I hope between two movies you'll get the time to, to have a stroll along the beach there in Normandy and Deauville. Thank you very much. Well, we'll leave you with pictures of that film called Jewel. And remember, you can find us on social networks, on our website to watch all of our shows and full interviews. Take care. Do you want to live? Yes. I don't believe you. I may be a size smaller than you. I'm going to kill her. A properly trained human body is a weapon. You're pretending to be me while I'm still alive? Even if I can't be with her, I don't want to be with you. Always use the gun if it's an option. Stop. I find guns to be boring and overused. If it's the difference between life and death, it's okay to be boring.